Hey, Michael J. So, Aquaria spoilers, Aquaria layer of behemoths. Man, there's just so many of them. Yeah, I mean, the this new alternative compressed, obviously, uh, current circumstances have us getting spoilers a mile a minute. And wow, I mean, this set has... I mean, we, already we've seen some crazy mechanics. We've seen sort of the three uh, the three color thing going on a little bit. We've seen um, at the I mean, at the very tippity top, the apex, if you will. Uh, already we've seen the cycle of uh, you know this set sort of big powerhouse cycle of monstrosities, the apex of like uh, the, the the biggest mutate, you know, the three color mutate monsters. Uh, dude, what do you think of these? So, yeah, we should, I think this is a perfect place to start. So, uh, for example, they drop Apex of Thunder is the Jess guy mutate, right? So, so far we've seen Apexes in each of the, each of the, the wedges, right? So Jess guy's got one, Sultai's got one, Abzan's got one, Teamer's got one, and Mardu's got one. And they're really powerful legendary creatures, uh, some of them are cats, some of them are dinosaurs, some of them are nightmares, and they they have this this ability mutate, which I think it's it's very similar to bestow, right? It's a creature that sort you of play on top of another creature, um, and then some crazy stuff happens, right? So, uh, in the case of all of the apexes, they have like a triggering ability that happens when you bestow them, or I'm sorry, when you mutate them onto another creature. And then they're also probably a giant monster at the same time. Uh, well, but th- there's more to it. Like when, uh, so, to use your example of Vadrock Apex of Thunder, Vadrock is blue, red, white for a 3 3 flying first strike. And uh, so, right up off top, it's like you have a Mantis Rider. Very much like in- you have a Mantis Rider. But instead of Vigilance and Haste, you got First Strike. And then there's this option to buy the for four mana where you pay one and then a blue or a white and two red to mutate. So you can spend four and then you can turn something into a Vade Rock in terms of you merge them together and you can keep the stats of whichever one's bigger, but you get all the abilities of both. And Vade Rock, one of Vade Rock's abilities is whenever this creature mutates, you may cast target non-creature card with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard without paying its mana cost. So that would apply not only when you mutate it on the way in, but also when it's already in play, if you mutate something else with it, it triggers again. Oh, wow. That's really crazy. So... If you had, like, just the three casting cost version of Vadrock out, because you just wanted to get in there, you got, like, this flying first striking gnarled mass that you summon for three mana, so you get in there a couple of times, then you follow it up with, a, I don't know, a, a five mana mutate, right? Like, uh, you want to, can you put Snapdax on top of Vadrox? That's the thing you can do? Yeah, so, absolutely. So when you do that, then Snapdax is... Triggered ability, so he he would get double strike, and then you said whenever this creature mutates, it deals four damage to target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls, and you gain four life, and then you get Vadrox ability, so you got like a a a warlord helix and a snapcaster mage, kind of kind of flying. Together. It's actually more powerful than a snapcaster mage, kind of right. Yeah, I mean you can hit to fairy time raveler. And it, it pays right, like, for it, right? So And it pays for it, right. So and but the thing is you get to keep doing this. So if you were to let's suppose that you played any random three drop on turn three. On turn four, you put Vadrock down, uh, you mutate it with Vadrock, and now you have their combined uh, abilities, and then you also get that trigger of Vadrock, so you can get back whatever you played on turn two. And then, or you had a two drop and then you played Teferi and they attacked it. Whatever the case may be, when you then play Snapdax, you get to trigger Vadrock and Snapdax. And, and if you, if you were to put something on top of that, like if you put Aluna on top of Vadrock slash Snapdax, you would get Aluna, Snapdax, and Vadrox triggers? Yes. Wow. Well, at least you can kill the creature in play in response to the mutating creature coming on top of it, right? That's a thing you can do. Yeah, which then, uh, 
this is another spot where uh, this part, it actually lines up kind of like with Bestow. Yeah. If the target goes away, then you end up with whatever the card is that you were mutating. Yes. Yeah, you don't get that mutate trigger. And most of them don't have mutate triggers. This is kind of a special case for the, the, the big bad mythics. But you would just get Vagrock in play. Uh, it would, you wouldn't get that mutate trigger because the other thing was gone. Yeah, but I think that one of the really attractive things about this mutate mechanic is if you think about it in kind of a, a creature enchantment sort of, you know, aura sort of context, you know, the knock against those kind of cards since the beginning of them back in Alpha was if you kill the creature underneath it, you're going to lose some some card economy. In this case, there's a powerful failsafe, which is you would just keep the creature. Uh, but it doesn't really work that way. You see, you sort of can... If like that fail safe, so to speak, is when they try to actually kill it in response to stop you from getting the mutate trigger. But in general, they can just let it resolve. Let one what let one creature mutate with another. And then if they use a kill spell, it does kill all of it, just like with auras. So you get them all. You do get them all. But right. right. This is not like bestow in that case. Okay. But it is still the case that your investment is protected from them trying to break it up by doing it in response to stop you from getting this trigger. You yeah. Know? It depends. Like if you have a damage based removal spell, I think a damage based ah, removal that's spell true. That's a great might point. Be really valuable. Like if they're starting with a Vadrock, which has a base power and toughness of three, three, and they're putting like a six, six on top of it. You're not going to have the luxury against the six, six body. You would have the luxury against the three, three body. Yeah. You don't get to kill the Aluna, but you know, at least you're not dealing with all these triggers in a body that's twice the size. Um, I do think that'll come up. And also, I think probably some corners on bounce spells and stuff like that. Yeah, that no, that's a great point. Yeah, changing the stats is just such a big part of it. So these are really exciting. Um, I think that... Do, do you think these creatures are, like... They're, like, pretty good a lot of the time when they're, when they're not mutating, but, like, not that good. Like, even Vadrock, I think... At a 3-3 three, three for 3 with multiple special abilities is, like, not the most exciting creature in the world uh, unless you're unless you're mutating it, right? Like, um, I think that's generally true for these guys, but they could be very... What about Snapdax? I mean, Snapdax is a 3-5 double striker. That's not bad four. for 4. Yeah, it's fine. Like, if if there was a card that was just, like, a 3-5 three, three, double striker for 4, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be burning down the... I'd be interested. ...the farm to play it. I dude, I've played Juzom. That's so much better than Juzom. Yeah, but I mean, if you ever get to mutate Snapdex, my goodness, War Leaders Helix for free. Like War Leaders Helix costs four. Right? Yeah, but you can't you can't go face though. It is it's close to Helix. You can't go face. I mean, I guess I'm thinking back to the number of War Leader Helixes I cast back in standard. I think I probably sent about seventy five percent to face. So that probably yeah, was right. Better. So it's still a powerful ability. All these guys have got some kind of fun thing to do when, when you're mutating them. Do you think these are all going to be constructed staples, all five? Uh, I don't know. It's going to depend on the color combinations. Um, I also just think there's just a lot to process with this. This is such a different mechanic. Yeah. Uh, I think that Nathri, Nathri Apex of Death, to me, uh, so a 5-5 five, five Death Touch Life Link for five, it's not bad, but I don't think it's good enough. I mean, you that's have like to... a big, big vampire Nighthawk, right? Five, five. Well, sort of. It doesn't fly. Bane Slayer Angel is a big vampire Nighthawk. No, nah, vampire Nighthawk. One of the things is great about it is the Death Touch made it punch up. I guess it yeah, but it punch up. That's five, five. exactly. That's what I'm saying. All right, fair enough. Flying is part of the. Anyway, the point is that uh, that one has such an expensive mutate ability. It's so good in spots, but it. It isn't clear that that's going to be what the format's going to be about. Um, I think Vadrock and Snapdax are just excellent. Uh, I think Brokos has got a he's got a clear niche. Like uh, so, actually, let's talk about Brokos for a second because I think he actually brings up some really interesting points. All right, so this is the one. Please, yeah. So it's five mana. It's two black, green, blue for a six six trample to start. Right, so six six for five with trample. That's not bad, right? All right, that's a pretty okay failsafe. But its ability is real strong. 
You may cast Brokox Apex of Forever from your graveyard using its mutate ability. And it mutates also for the same amount. It mutates for five. So uh, a little bit different, right? So it's two, uh, a blue or a black, and then two green. Well, and one of the things that's interesting about the mutate being different, you could be playing, picture you're playing just a straight up blue-green ramp deck. Yep. If you're just playing blue-green ramp, maybe you can backdoor black mana because you've got some paradise druids, or maybe you even have one land in your deck that makes black mana, but you don't actually have to play black because you can just mutate the card as Ah. the normal way if you wanted, right? Very nice point. Uh, and uh, even if you're playing like a modest amount of one of those two colors out of blue or black, you can still be a lot more, uh, you know, you have this reliable backup plan. And the normal case with this guy, you know, you only have to play him forward. You only have to play him using all three the first time if you even want to. But he has virtual haste if you mutate him, so it's not like you even want to that often. I mean, this is a, a riotous card to throw onto like a... A Nissa land, right? Like the Nissa land has three plus one plus one counters, right? Right, so, which you carry up. So, so already he's like a you know, nine nine that trample vigilance haste. Yep, nice. That's Brokox a big game. No black seems like. I think you. I don't know how many you want to play though. That's the thing, right? You, well, you, and you, here's the reason you. I do. It's one. Yeah, you get them with Cavaliers. You get it with Mythos of Brakos. So Mythos of Brakos is two green-green sorcery. Uh, If blue-black was spent to cast this spell, search your library for a card, put that card into your graveyard, then shuffle your library. But in any case, you return up to two permanent cards from your graveyard to your hand. So normally, if you were to just play this for green, for two green-green, it's a double regrowth, but for permanents only. That's already not too bad. That's That's like good. Yeah, that's interesting, right? I, I want a PTQ with two Elven Caches in my deck. Just putting it out there. So if you are playing this in a Sultai ramp deck, however, you can spend four and go get your Brokos, and then the two permanent cards you draw from your graveyard could just be other things. Yeah, the Brokos just stays in the graveyard where it's doing the most damage. So you actually are getting a three for one. So you get the Demonic Tutor for Brokos, but you also get two permanents back. Uh, and of course, you don't have to just go get the one Brokos. It's just a nice option to go get because a lot of the time you might just want to go get uh, the Titan, Uro, you know? Yeah. But like the thing about Uro is that you have to have a lot of cards in your graveyard. Let's suppose that you don't already have a ton of cards in your graveyard. Well, Brokos is a nice one to go get that you could play from your graveyard. Without needing lots of cards deck, you know, to exile. So, like, I think the possibility of playing one Pelucranos Unchained, one Brokos, and four Uro, that's a very attractive package for a Soul Tie deck. So, let me think about and, this for a sec. Yeah. Just like, I, I remember last week or before, we were talking about the card Once in Future. Even if you don't have the Demir Clause on this, this card is, like, pretty on the level of Once in Future, right? It's 2GG. And once a future is like almost requires you to have more G than two GG to get the full effect out of it. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of restriction on once in future that is not here because this is only two permanent cards from your grave in your hand. So that is a that is worse. But at the same time, the front side of this, the the Demir side, you just get a card. It doesn't have to be a permanent card, right? Like that's real strong. Oh yeah. Plus, you, you get to open up a toolbox of sorts right like you can put one murderous out, uh if you have one murderous rider in your deck that's such an additional dimension but also if you have murderous riders in your deck you can cheat the system like uh you being able to go get murderous rider out of your deck and then regrow it with mythos means that now you have a hero's downfall type effect like, you actually were able to tutor for, through your deck for a hero's downfall. Yeah, it's super flexible. Yep. So uh, I think that Mythos of Brokos is uh, is the real deal. And if you're going to play Brokos, Apex of Forever, uh, one is probably the more likely number. 
but you know. All right, so help me out with this card, Mythos of Nithroi, because I think I know how this card works. I just want to make sure I got this right. So all these Mythos cards uh, are named after one of the Apex guys, and then they can be cast like regular for just a single color of mana, but if you get the full wedge going, they, they're a little bit better. So Mythos of Brokos is a double regrowth, no matter what, but it's like a demonic tutor plus regrowth. If you if you pay the pay the demir, mythos right. It, it's kind of a modal card, so of sorts, you know. Mythos of Nethroi is two and a B for an instant. I think being instant is pretty important, and it has the text destroy target non land permanent. If it's a creature or if GW was spent to cast this spell, so. It can always just it can always just murder, right? Like it's it's always it is easier to cast murder every time. This card is just better than murder. Setting aside, you know, specific deflection things like if you have no creatures in play, your opponent can't misdirection your murder. Versus, whereas they can misdirection this because they could just misdirect it to your own land anyway, and it fizzle. So but yes, but if you pay. Abzan Charm mana, then you could just kill any non-land. So you could kill a Planeswalker, for example. So this card in the correct deck is substantially more flexible than Hero's Downfall, right? Because you could kill an artifact, you can kill an enchantment, you can kill whatever, just not a land. Right. This is black, green, white for uh, all of it. Hero's Downfall, Bedevil, Mortify, it gets all of them. It's everything the Oblivion Ring would hit, you know? Like, But uh, it also has the backup option of if you're missing one or both, you know, one or two colors, you can still play it as a murder. Yeah, that's, Another thing that's really interesting that's cool. is that it's only a black card. So if the card was black, green, and white, it would not be able to hit something that had protection from white. Oh. Mythos of Nethroi can actually hit, can if, like, if you have white mana still kill a protection from white card. Which I think is just kind of interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, at the same time, even though its cast is so... Like, it's so particular, right? It's specifically GWB, right? Because it's a three-mana spell. Like, it it won't ever trigger a, a hero of Precinct 1, right? Because it's just a black card, right? Even yep. Though it, even though it's... It's practically a multicolored card when you're doing the Vindicate-ish version instead of, like, the murder version. But it's strictly a black card. Yep. Uh, yeah, these, these cards are, are really, really interesting. I think, the, I think these Mythos are all going to see a lot of play. Uh, maybe more than their Apexes, but... Are you, really? Are you, you think that uh, Mythos of Vadrock will see more play than Vadrock Apex of Thunder? No, I think that as soon as I said that, I knew that Mythos of Phaedrock might be a poor exception. But I do think Mythos of Nithroi will be widely played, and Mythos of Brakos seems really powerful. And Mythos of Snapdax for that, for that, woof. Like this, it's like but a, you don't think Snapdax himself is really good? I think, there's, I think that there will be more Mythos of Snapdax played than Snapdax played. That's what I think. Like, you might see a deck that has, like, Two, I mean, I don't know, maybe playing four snap decks is the right number in some decks. But I think there's going to be decks that, like, just have, like, three Mythos of snap decks in them. It's like a very Cataclysm card. Like, people played four Cataclysm in their white league. No, Cataclysm destroys land, man. This is a lot more of a uh, Gear Hulk type card. Yes, it is more of a Gear Hulk type card. It's, it's potentially devastating, though, right? Lots of things are. Um, all right. I think, dude, I, I don't know, man. I'm into snap decks. But either way, I agree that Mythos of Brakos and Mythos of Nathroi are going to see more play than their Apexes. We don't know yet with the blue Mythoses yet, so kind of hard to to be uh, to be on that one. But, uh, man, we, we know about a ton of other things in this, in this set as well. Uh, before we move off the Mutate tip, though, for a minute. What did you think of C Dash or Octopus? The one blue blue, two two flash. Whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, draw a card, mutate one in a blue. Uh, I mean, this card just seems incredible to me. 
right? Like, if you just cast it for one blue blue at the end of your opponent's turn, uh, and they, you know, they don't have anything up at the time and it resolves, they're, aren't they in a lot of trouble? Like... Why do you even need to wait till the end of your opponent's turn? It has virtual haste. You could go turn one Gilded Goose, yeah. turn two attack with the Goose, and mutate it with the Octopus. Oh, well... Yeah, the virtual haste is... I mean, it's really, really powerful. This card is... It's un- unbelievable how powerful this card is, I think. I was Unbelievable? Like it's really... I, there's I, no, I don't know. I can believe it. <laughs> there's no cards like this right now. Like Ninja of the Deep Hours? Like in Standard, though? No, but Ninja of the Deep Hours was only the mutate part, right? That's, that's No, it also bounced your guy instead of like having it merge together with this. Yeah, so you would get, I guess, I guess if you had like some sort of one enters the battlefield triggers yeah yeah Yeah, i mean they're different but like the fact that you could just cast this with flash at the end of your opponent's turn or something like that it's like like this is a card that i think will widely see play in decks that don't even have any other creatures they're just going to play this in their sideboard or something and it's going to really people out of board yeah oh i don't know don't you think i bet it's not way it's like just better than than robber of the rich and a lot of the spots where people are Busting it up with Robert or the Rich? No. All right. I think I think we'll find out. This one seems really good. Yeah. No, I think it's fine. I think it's a good card. I just don't think it's going to be widely played in decks without any other creatures, you know? All right. But well, it, either way, it's it's an exciting card. I bet it's going to be one of the most overrated cards in the set, though. Uh, what do you think of uh, the possibility giving this guy Double Strike? Uh, how would you do that? Well, so one thing you could do is have the 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 Snapdax already in play, and then you just attack with Snapdax, and then your opponent's like, well, I'm not going to mess with that. I can't fight that. That's yeah. a 3-5 double strike. And then you go, bloop, and you so put down you the octopus. You take the hell on top of that. Yeah. You, well, don't put it on top. Put it on the bottom. Let Snapdax be on top. But... You'll have a three five. It'll just be you'll instantly get to deal four with uh, Snapdax's shot ability, you know his mutate ability, and then you also draw two cards because of double strike combining with the octopus. All right. Well, that's that's pretty disgusting. I mean, that is a well, lot of colors. I thought you were going to say, is there a, is there one of the 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 cycling creatures that can give a a keyword token? Is there one that gives double strike? Well, no, I mean, it. no, but uh, I don't know, man. I think that Snapdax, you can, like, it doesn't have to be as many colors as it might seem on the surface. Like, that's not necessarily, I don't know. We'll see. What about Dirge Batman? 3-3 three, three, Flying Flash, whenever this creature mutates, destroy target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls. So this is like, so it's, it's, I'm going to call it its fail state, is a 3-3... Three, three, it's a basically like a phantom monster, right? With Flash, which is... A wind in of sorts. It's not good, but it's not terrible. But if, you, if you're if you mutating it, ah, uh, 6, that's kind of a lot to mutate. I guess if you mutated the other way, it'd be, it'd be more cost-effective. It's just a Necrotal, right? And it's probably fine. It, I think that there's going to be decks that really want to emphasize this kind of an interaction. But if you compare this... On a mutate basis, this costs six, and you know the it's a four four mana three three flyer. Snapdax does I think as much or more a lot of the time as this mutate ability, and is also in black, and I feel like is going to do so more cost effectively for you a lot of the time. And plus, it's like his regular body is way way more effective in combat. So you're not into the dirge bat, huh? I I think that the dirge bat is like. It's like the 9, 10, 11 kind of card, not the 1, 2, 3 kind of card to me. Okay, so uh, how would you feel about, uh, in general, a creature having kicker, two colorless, destroy target creature or planeswalker, and opponent controls? I mean, that's obviously a very good kicker. All right, so at the uh, is it enough? Like, if you had just 3-3 three, three flying flash... With kicker to destroy target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls, would you consider that card? 
I, I think that's pretty on the edge. Okay. Again, so, I think it's on the wrong side of the edge for me. Okay. So uh, in addition to that card, which is sort of what this is like, uh, let's imagine that you attack with any creature that's not 3-3. Three, three. What if your opponent blocks? So you're saying it's potentially a giant growth and then also this kind of necrotolish ability and then also potentially an upgrade. Also gives flying. I, 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 don't, I don't think it's terrible. Like I said, it's just like a 9, 10, 11 card, just not like a 1, 2, 3 card. Right? Just, I mean, I think I'd add it if I had a bunch of other stuff that maybe made sense with it, but I, it's not a card that I'm going to you know, want to start building around to begin with. It's not that exciting to me. Uh, what, I mean, part of it is also, I think, that there's just some value to just cards that mutate. Yeah. Uh, partly because you get to trigger your other, like you get to trigger Snapdax or whatever, but also partly because uh, some of the colors have a sort of mutate sub-theme. You know, like, for instance, uh, and it might be all of them, but I bet it's not, Uh Polywog symbiote is one in a blue for a one three frog that has each creature you spell each creature spell you cast costs one less to cast if it has mutate and whenever you cast a creature spell if it has mutate draw a card then discard a card so this card doesn't itself have mutate but it encourages you to play other guys with mutate yeah if you have this card and you don't actually have to mutate the cards with mutate they just have to have mutate so if you have a Polywog Symbiote, it's a mana accelerator for your cards, whether or not you mutate them. And then each time you play one of them, it's kind of like this permanent uh, innkeeper of sorts. Like every time you play one of those other creatures, you'll get to loot. Um, that actually begs the question, do you think there's going to be decks that have got like 30 plus mutate triggers in the, in the starting Maybe probably not forty, but more than thirty. Uh, why thirty? I'm just thinking about like a reasonable amount of cards left. I think I think I think there's going to be some decks that uh, I think twenty four sounds pretty good. Twenty four mutate triggers. Cards with mutate. Yeah. I don't know that they're all going to have triggers, but twenty four cards with mutate. Because remember, even if you play one that doesn't have a trigger itself. It triggers all the other ones. You also need to get the party started, right? So you can't have all expensive guys, right? You need to have some polywogs to, to just have something in play to play your, your first guy on turn three with Mutate, which you can cheaper because of the polywog zone ability. Yeah, totally. Dude, if you want a card to... Here's a card to Mutate. I don't even know what's going on with this card. Help me walk through it, because maybe I'm missing something, but this card seems bananas to me it's the blue red the is it one what right uh no, no not that one it's the 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 mutate the blue red mutate card where is it uh but when you mutate with it uh yeah lord D- dracus one blue red for a two three whenever this creature mutates return target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand and it has mutate, is it, is it? All right, so to begin with, this card is a 2-3 three for 3 in red. So classic Hurloon Minotaur stats. And it's just nothing if you're just casting it, right? It's just a 2-3 just a three for 3. But that's Un- Unless you mutate later, right? Yeah. But yeah. But so it's claws, and also, but it's, its own mutate cost is very economical, right? So it's, it's either, you know, blue-red... Blue, blue, or red, red for the two, three, which is you know we're talking some uh, some elvish warrior stats now. And well, no, about- you're not really you're not getting elvish warrior because you have to put it on something. So you're not adding two, three worth of stats to the table. You might be adding no stats to the table. Fair enough. But you might be adding you might be adding some. So here's the thing. It's got a. It's basically just re- regrowth every time you you do a mutate, whether it's top or bottom, which, or relearn. But yeah, which would be pretty powerful. Uh, but here's the thing: the limitation is that it's instant or sorcery. So 
it's is that like a little choppy? Like how many instant sorcerers are we going to have in the graveyard? Because uh, like I don't know. It depends. I'm picturing like playing with ancestral recall, time walk, brainstorm, force of will. Or if I was playing a different format, I guess I'm playing with like thought scour, lightning bolt, opt. I if you're if you're playing standard, what if you just put this card in your mono red deck? You can play four steam vents if you want. It's not like you ever want to cast this as a Hurlum Minotaur. I you don't see. even have to play steam vents. Just put this in a mono red deck, and for two mana, you can get back one of your burn spells and upgrade your guy in combat. Keep whatever his abilities are, but like uh, or plus one plus one counters. You know, like uh, for instance, if you're attacking with uh, what's the, what's the you're, the dude you always play that you get all the red mana. Uh, steamkin? Yeah, if you steamkin, you know, like now your steamkin, boom, surprise. He doesn't, you know, have, like, he doesn't have flash, does he? No, but I'm saying that you're, it's, it's haste. Sure, virtual haste. Okay. But, yeah, because you're not only giving him plus one, plus two from this guy, it counts as a red card. That's fair. And um, you still get to keep all the counters. I didn't think about this in a mono red deck, but I'm going to have to noodle on this. I am not currently a big believer in Lord Dracus, but maybe I'll be converted to a, a crazy believer in Lord Dracus. Uh, it seems like a little... You need a little setup in... Well, I don't know. It seems like it's its not mana-wise constructed in a way that is pleasing to me in like my aesthetics of how this should go. Uh, so how good is two mana... Uh, like, how good would just straight up, is it, is it, return a target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand? With no body? It's just a, it's just a spell? Yep. Uh, that's probably not good enough. You would totally play that in some spots, right? Yeah, I mean, like, I guess you would. I, I guess it's, like, good enough as, like, a one or a two of in certain combo decks that have big mana, and I guess like, it's, it's I'm I'm unenthusiastic about that card. I, I think it's fine. Now, what about uh, Laura Dracus in the context of a deck that has like sixteen mutate cards? Sixteen. Because remember, it doesn't exile the card that you get back. It's not like Snapcaster where you run out of the stuff. You could just play the same card over and over and over and over again. Yeah, I'm just trying to think about like how I would construct a deck, right? So I buy that I don't need to be blue and red, right? Because if I'm mutating, I can just mutate with blue or I can mutate just with red. So let's say, can I- Yeah, but you could be three colors, be three colors. If you're going to play with like a whole bunch, like Vadrock, play a Vadrock deck with this guy. Like I feel like, Mike, Mike, I I don't know yet, but my current imagination of some of these mutate decks is like, they are leaning very hard into mutating, right? They're getting tons of triggers. I don't know that they need to. I don't know about need to. I think like if the format evolves a certain way, whoever's mutating the most and the most powerfully is going to be at an advantage, right? So there's gonna why? Be- no, not right. Why? Why would it? Because that's that it. They do stack up in a way that isn't necessarily pure upside. It's pretty good, but like it topples if everybody's just trying to play as much mutate as they can and try to stack them all on one. Then a card like uh, some of the kill spells in this in this set, there's any kill spell. Yeah, like a, like the, like the mythos we were talking about before, like the the Abzan mythos can kill most anything, right? If if that's the structure. Yeah, I, well, and some of these are just like crazy strong, right? I mean, isn't it kind of like, if anything, I mean, like for instance, dire tactics, white black exile target creature. If you don't control a human, you lose life equal to that creature's toughness. Like you got me. Wow. Right? Okay. <laughs> if anything, I worry that the removal is too good. I mean, we'll see. But I mean, you looks- don't even have the downside a good chunk of the time, right? Like, would you play that card if there was no non-downside? In a lot of formats. Yeah, it'd be pretty. It's like, it's fine. Yeah, right. Here's one. What Heartless Act. One in a black instant. Choose one. Destroy target creature with no counters on it or remove up to three counters from target creature. Like, is that not 
really good. So one version of it is just destroys Arctic Cre- Most creatures don't have counters. <laughs> like, like Do you see like, what I mean? Like, what percentage of creatures have counters? It's not zero, right? Like, it's way less than 10%, though. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to tell you, man. Like, I think that this world you're envisioning where people just want to put 32 mutate cards on top of each other... I don't think it's really going to play that's out. Gonna that's that's going to be part of the metagame. I think... That'll be part, but that won't be very big. I think people are going to draw cards, and I think some people are going to want to make turtles happen. I, I I think, like, that card, Yadaro Wandering Monster, has tugged at the heartstrings of a wide swath of potential Johnny deck builders. Yeah. I think that, that guy's going to be good. I think he's going to be good in an... Iron Crag deck, and I think he's probably going to be great in a Fires of Invention deck. Great in that deck. I can believe it. I mean, 8-8 uh, eight, eight Trample Haste is pretty legit, and it's not like you can't get up to 7 mana. Yeah. And then you the fact that you don't even have to, and if you just surprise hit him with two turtles at the same time, like one, and then... Well, I mean, it's, it's not, not in the same yeah. turn because yeah. of the legendary, right? Yeah, but I mean, like... Uh, oh, the other thing is that... Uh, I don't know, man. It remains to be seen um, how, like, Fires of Invention is actually kind of like a really interesting topic, right? Like, the we haven't even broached these companions yet. Uh, some of them slot so well into existing strategies, right? And the companions are the ones where there's 10 different ones and they're across all the different hybrid color combinations, for two colors, you ha- you have to play at least one of the two. And the way they work is you put you can have uh, one in your sideboard, I mean, you can have more, but you can only companion with one. And uh, if you put it in your sideboard, and then you have to meet a special deck building requirement, and then uh, once per game, so first at the beginning of the game, before you even start the game, you have to declare your companion, show it to your opponent. But then second of all, once per game, you can just play the card out of your uh, out of your sideboard. And so you have both the selection from, uh, you know, you can count on this and then also the implicit card advantage of having an extra piece of material. But some of these. So basically, if you didn't have to change your deck at all, the only cost to you is one fifteenth of your sideboard. And you have to give your opponent some information before the game starts, if you're even playing one where they don't already have your list. I mean, only about your sideboard, right? Because, it, you know, in the condition that you're talking about... It well, it tells you a lot about your deck. Yeah. But yeah, so a lot of these... Uh, and I know a lot of people are kind of freaking out about these, but I bet it'll be fine. So, uh, I, I, this, this is my thoughts on the companions. Right now, anyway. If the cost to play the companion is trivial, right? Like, you don't have to do anything to play the companion in terms of your your deck, your card selection for your deck to begin with. The companions are, they're not only pure upside, but it's like everybody... Not pure. You have to use a sideboard slot. Like, a substantial amount of upside. And it's like everybody else kind of mulligan. If they don't play companions, if the deck building cost is trivial enough, some of these deck building costs are 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 pretty prohibitive. Okay, so let me give you an example of one of the easiest ones. This card is just going to be able to, if you want it, you could just slot this into a lot of decks in powered formats with zero changes. Luris of the Dream Den yes. is one Orzov Orzov for a three-two legendary cat nightmare. Each permanent card in your starting deck has converted mana cost two or less. And it's a 3-2 lifelink. That's the the, the quest, yep. is you can only play with permanents that cost two or less among your permanents. It's a 3-2 lifelink. During each of your turns, you may cast one permanent spell with converted mana cost two or less from your graveyard. So if you were, for instance, playing an ad nauseum deck, they don't play with any permanents that cost more than two. They have Lotus Petals, and they have Lion's Eye Diamonds. You could have a Xanthid Swarm, I guess, maybe. But 
they're not playing with anything that would prohibit this. As long as they're willing to use one sideboard slot, then you can just have a 3-2 lifelinker. Now, you might be like, oh, well, Ad Nauseam doesn't really care about having a 3-2 lifelinker that much. Maybe. Sometimes that's not a bad blocker, though, right? And then the fact that you can actually use it for free storm, well, now we're really getting somewhere, right? Yeah. You lines eye diamond and you're doing that stuff, you can just build the storm count by one by playing Loris out of your uh out of your cyborg and then build it by another one by playing that lion's eye diamond. That's pretty so powerful. It's, it's plus two storm for zero mana deterministically. So here's the thing in that spot. You know. Here's the thing about Luris of the dream den. Now I'm going to go to a predictable place with my example, but this is a very good example of the same thoughts. I think uh, as you're talking about an ad nauseum, what do you think about Luris of the dream den? And Oh, I don't know. A modern burn deck. Many modern burn decks can already produce two white because they play cards like Core Firewalker. This card is extraordinarily powerful in a modern burn deck sideboard because it's essentially free. They have to make no changes. Nobody... Uh, no, what about Rift Bolt? Oh, no, 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 never mind. Cards. You're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Permanent card. Yep, totally. Yeah. Yep. Literally... Yeah, you have to make essentially no changes. Literally zero. And here's the other thing. If you play with Seal of Fire, so I've been, I started playing with Seal of Fire last year. Uh, Seal of Fire seemed like a fantastic way to set off spectacles. It costs one. It fits in a lot of the rules that I wanted to play in Burn. I mean, like, if Luris is rebuying a Seal of Fire every turn, I mean, besides the fact that it could just be getting back creatures that die in combat or whatever. like It has virtual, like, you can do it immediately. If you have four mana, you can just play Luris and then immediately get your Seal of Fire back. Yeah. It's really, really strong in a modern Burn deck. As long as, you, as long as you're happy to play a second color, right? So some people, like myself, have just gone to just playing mono red. But this seems like a really easy thing to do if you wanted to play either black or white. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a decent school of thought about playing cards like Bump in the Night, etc. So you could go that direction. Or you could go the Raptor direction and play Manamorphose. All bets are off. It's easy to cast if you have Manamorphose. Um, it's not going to be too hard to cast anyway. No, it's a, I think. super easy to cast. Right, and there's I mean, there's even a there's even a horizon canopy in color for you. Yeah, but it's possible you're even just a Mardu deck. Yeah, you, in a Mar- you could just play this in a Mardu deck. I mean, a Mardu deck in modern right now tends to have more expensive cards than than that. No, 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 no. I'm saying a Ma- a, a Mardu burn deck. Oh, okay. Because, like, for instance, take your Boros burn decks. If you're just to look at your Boros burn deck, it's not like you couldn't just add some uh, Black Cleave Cliffs at a pretty low cost. For sure. And that's another way you could help play Luris, even if you have no black cards besides Luris. Yeah, the other thing is you could just... This card seems like it would be great to slot into certain types of Abzan decks uh, that have got, like, very high leverage permanents that only cost two. For example, a Tarmogoyf or a... Or a scavenging ooze, stuff that, that's, you know, very likely to die. Or, I don't know, a, a dark confidant. Uh, white weenie decks, black weenie decks, zombie decks can all leverage this card. And a lot of them have interesting low-cost permanents that you might want to get back on a per-turn basis. Like, a Myers Grasp might not seem like the most exciting card to play, but it's not bad. And if, if you're designing your deck in such a way that, you know, you're just going to get free Myers Grasp every turn in a creature matchup, that's pretty good. Dude, this card is so good with Black Lotus. Like, if you just play Black Lotus, you can immediately get Luris for free and then play your Black Lotus again. It's just free. And then you have a... Th- this is this is some kind of Slash Panther, isn't it? You just well, Black but, Lotus, but, Luris, Black Lotus? Yeah, but it's just you free. have it in play now, and yeah. the next turn, you're if you had no other acceleration, you're already at eight mana. Well, and you also have a Slash Panther. Right? Like, Slash Panther isn't good. It's just Dude. contextually great. You just basically start the game with a 3 2 light. So, I don't know. This card is definitely busted in some power formats. But even but if we just look is, at. It's insane and modern. It's just. Yeah. It's but I'm saying let's scroll all the way to standard because anywhere that's powerful, like any format, like whether it's modern or legacy or vintage, whatever, you can just play with all cheap cards anyway. So let's set that aside for a minute. Maybe Luris gets banned in a bunch of those formats. In standard, what if you play this in a blue-white or blue-black control deck? 
in the sideboard you don't want to uh i don't think it's going to be very good in the blue white control deck in standard at all so you think the problem is that it's just too much incentive set it aside blue white then maybe blue black but you think too much of the power is in like planeswalkers and that nobody's playing some drago creatureless deck i mean in a blue white control deck for sure all the cards I actually want to play are three mana planeswalkers and Elspeth Congress death. Or at the end, like Dream. Yeah, but what about blue black? Blue black. Um, let me think about blue black for a second. Uh, I, first question would be like, how am I going to win? Because I'm, Luris itself is not a reliable way to win. Uh, maybe. I don't know. I think, I think you still need to have some powerful high end permanence in blue black, something along the lines of a Liliana or. Uh, something sure. along the lines of a, you know, a Nicol Bolas. I, th- I think it's. I'm not a huge fan of it in in either of those in either of those strategies for standard. The cards are too good. That's the problem. Uh, what do you think of just using this card in some sort of uh, aggro deck? I think even the aggro decks in standard, the the cards are too expensive. Like if you if you think about like a white weenie deck in standard, those decks kind of want to have a Heliod, right? They they want to have cards that are more expensive. The the uh, the the black ones want to have a rankle. They want to have a uh, you know some kinds of four four demons or knights that have a bunch of counters on them. Or for that matter, you know if you're, you're talking about multicolor aggro decks, they tend to want to have Embercleave, which is way out of cost. So, uh, so what about Karuga the Macro Sage? This one for standard is three Simic Simic for a five four. Um, and when it enters the battlefield, you draw a card for each other permanent you control with converted mega cost three or greater. And the quest, the companion quest, is your starting deck can only have cards that have converted mana cost three and higher or land. I, I cannot imagine wanting to play a deck in standard right now. What? This card is incredible. Okay, what if you're playing Fires of Invention? What cards in a Fires of Invention deck even cost two or less? Just stuff that's been cut. You're right. It's been cut? What do you mean cut? Like uh, Shimmers. People used to play Shimmer Possibility. They don't play that anymore. Right. Um, At this point, Aether Gust and like other cheap two-mana removal spells are the only things people play, and they don't even play that many. Whether it's Lightning, you know, any of the different two-mana removal spells, you can just not play those. Besides, you can get a lot of that value from stuff like Brazen Borrowers and uh, Bone Crusher Giant. Yeah, those are those are effective two mana spells that are three casting cost or more in the in the the creature side. But you can play Aether Gusts, right? They just have to be in your sideboard. They just can't be in your starting deck. Uh, if you want, but if you sideboard them in, you won't get to companion. Oh, okay. But the uh, the. Dude, the Karuga seems really strong. And it's not like a 5-4 is a trivial threat. And if you have a 5-4, I mean, a 5-4 is like, uh, I'm sorry, the extra cards it draws you is like very real. Yeah, I guess it'll draw three cards on average, right? If it's going to draw a lot of cards. I think this card looks incredible. Okay, I stand correct. I just didn't think about playing it in... Uh... In a Fires of Invention deck, which is weird because I did think about playing the Turtle in a Fires of Invention deck. So what about Obosh the Prey Piercer? This is three Rakdos Rakdos for a 3-5. And if a source you control with an odd converted mana cost would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals double that damage to that permanent or player instead. Uh, And then its quest is you can only play with odds and land. I mean, this card is really, really extraordinarily powerful. I was just thinking about this. I'm like, oh my god, every Jackal Pup is going to deal four. But the problem is, like, you still have to get this five caster into play, right? And then to take advantage of that stuff. And I don't, I don't know. I think being like off mana on, on some of these turns, I'm not real attracted to that. Like, wait, why do you have to be off mana? You it's so two okay. ones on turn two like that. So first of all, yeah, if you're playing Obosh, step one is play with more uh, one mana cards. Step two is that if you have to play with any temples or anything like that, that's part of the mix. They're free. S- step three uh, is stuff like Bone Crusher Giant, or you can just use Mutate. Like for instance, if you have a uh, a a card that costs three 
like Vadrox, you can mutate it for four and get more value that way. Or if you have like a lot of cards, just have an alternate ca- cost that you can play that uh, that that doesn't count towards the same thing. Activated abilities is another way to spend your mana efficiently. Okay. Uh, expel. So, but this guy has like virtual haste as well. Even though he doesn't attack immediately, all your creatures will immediately deal double damage. Yeah, I mean that's it, that's really powerful if you get him into play and your burn spells will do double damage like how sick is it to be able to play a red aggro deck and just know that you have a really good red five drop and you don't have to play any cards in your deck that cost that much like that's so good or here's another one let's say you're playing an obs on deck if this is in your in your sideboard and you're doing obs on you're playing odds ons uh, <laughs> dude, like, what if you play Kethis on turn three? You can just play four copies of Kethis. So Kethis is the three four legend that makes your legendary spells cost one less, and then you can also exile two to be able to play one out of the graveyard. Yep. So if you have Kethis, it's first of all a three four body for three is not too bad, right? But second of all, you get to accelerate Obosh, who's a legend. And you have it deterministically, and it's on curve. You're not missing a mana on the turn. So if you go turn three Kethis, it's implied that you get Obosh on the next turn. That's hot. Yeah. That's, like, going to be very, like, that, that. the fact that you just have that for sure as part of what Kethis means... And it's not like there aren't a ton of odd cards that you might want to play. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to think about about the deck construction. Because I, I thought that the deck building cost was going to be kind of high on this, but I think you might have convinced me already. It's not trivial, necessarily. Or Here's another one. What about Witch's Oven and Cauldron Cat? The With Cauldron Obosh? Familiar. Yeah. So, like, if you're... Every, po- every like cat if- becomes a jackal pup? I kind of like that. Uh, like part of it is just if you've got Obosh and uh, your sacrifice isn't very high, this card is like a powerful permanent, you know? Yeah, now you're going to lose the priest or whatever, but like, I don't know. Th- I would keep an eye on this one. And then what about Gar- uh, Garuda Doom of Depths for Demir Demir for a 6 6? When it enters the battlefield, each player puts the top four cards of their library into the graveyard and then put a creature card with an even converted mana cost from among those cards onto the battlefield. And you can only play with evens in order to play Garuda. I mean, this one's really strong. For zero cards, deterministically, at a spot of your choosing, first of all, you have a 6-6 cantrip, right? Second of all, you're milling some cards, which could be good for you. But third of all, you could just spike something off your opponent. And then fourth of all, you could build your deck in a way to actually exploit this. Because, like, you don't have to play this card the first time that you have six mana. Like, what if you could set up the top of your deck? Like, if you just knew that the top card of your deck was Grizzlebrand or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I was just a simpler mage than you. I was thinking, like, man, you could just play Croxa with this guy. That'd be pretty good. Yeah, like, just being able to play Garuda at all, I mean, if you can, like, cheat something huge, but I don't know. Uh, this card seems powerful. This one, I don't know. The restrictions are not going to be trivial necessarily, but... Do you think that the the restriction of playing all evens is more prohibitive than playing all odds? Because, like, having no. evens means you don't get ones. That's the thing. Yeah, I, I think that all odds is not as prohibitive as all evens. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, companions seem, companions seem like they're going to change magic a little more than some of the other stuff, but I think mutates are going to be really exciting for folks. Yeah, definitely. What's your favorite card so far? Mm. Man, good question. I don't know, like to play with or to, uh, or that I think is the most powerful. Oh, I mean, I was thinking about it more like the one that really gets my 
gets my kind of creative engine going is Yadara Wandering Monster. I don't know if that's the best card, right? I think it's probably a good card, and I think it's going to be way less good for what people want it to do than what those people want it to do, but then it will be good in other ways, right? That's the thing. Like, I think Yadara Wandering Monster is a 5RR for an 8-8 Trample Haste, and it has cycling one and an R. It has this ability where if you cycle it four times, then you can just you just get an eight eight, right? So you can you, you don't even have to cast it; you just get it. And when you cycle it, you put it back into your library shuffled rather than put it into your graveyard. So it has this very Gaia's blessing feel for people who who would be inter- interested in that kind of stuff. And it has obviously a ton of other synergies you can play with, like if you want to draw extra cards, it does that without casting a spell. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I think that it's very appealing to people who are looking for that sort of a thing. Um, I don't know that it'll turn out to be the most powerful. I, I would be skeptical of that part, but it's weird because so many of these cards, it's like, it really depends on what, what, what way the format breaks, you know? Do you think there'll be uh, like our current standard where like, there's just these wildly different decks that emerge and, a ton of different stuff is possible, and many of the decks are very exciting and different and not... Yeah, oh, for sure. It hasn't been stale at all, which is crazy to me that the, the format hasn't been stale at all for several, several weeks. Yeah, I mean, uh, the power level has not looked weak. And some of these cards are just so foundational. They're going to change things in a way. Um, like, uh, it, but I think that Mutate has such an endless well of combos possible that it might be like, we might not see mutate combos that would have been good now before the next set comes out. It's like, there's just so many possible combinations, you know, of ways to combine all cards, text boxes. (laughs) So to me, that's, that's the part that's, uh, the I guess it's overall all the mutate cards. Um, I think that the quests they present, it's uh, the entire mutate mechanic is my favorite. I guess that's fair. All right. So uh, I don't know. There's not going to be any shortage of stuff for us to talk about next week. Yep. Uh, and dude, uh, I'll see you then, where we can. Uh, touch on all the two mana removal spells that will invalidate all the sweet stuff you and I want to do. Life didn't work so great. Tried to play dredge as a jailer hate. Ghostly prison waiting for my untapped phase. Your core trapped in amber stasis. Please.